All right, guys, continuing on with our talk about the reproductive system. So, so far we've talked about the male reproductive system. We've talked about the um, uh, structures of the male reproductive system. We've talked about gametogenesis. We talked about meiosis and the special cell division that gives rise to gametes. Now, I hope it's clear that meiosis occurs in both males and females. We've only talked about its role in spermatogenesis, but now we'll get into its role in oogenesis, the production of uh, female gametes. But before we do that, we need to elaborate a little bit on the function of hormones in stimulating gametogenesis. So first we'll take the approach of talking about it in the male, and then we'll talk about it in the female. It's, it's pretty straightforward in the male, whereas in the female it's a little more circuitous. So you might recall that when we talked about the endocrine system, I mentioned this concept of things called axes, or an axis. So an axis, like its name implies, is just a shaft. So when we have an axis, it means um, connectivity along a endocrine route in this case. So we talk about the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Well, we know that the hypothalamus releases um, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GnRH. And this happens, there's an upsurge of this at, at, at puberty. And so when the hypothalamus releases larger amounts of GnRH, the anterior pituitary then corresponds by releasing more FSH and LH. And FSH and LH, um, as it says here, directly stimulate the uh, process of spermatogenesis in the... Um, in the male. The gonads in turn produce testosterone and testosterone has a negative feedback effect on the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Such that if you have a dip in testosterone levels then your FSH and LH levels are going to go up and once testosterone levels are elevated then FSH and LH secretion are inhibited. There's another negative feedback hormone that the um, sperm uh, release and that's called inhibin. Okay, so let's get into this role here. I like to go to the pictures. So here we have a diagram up at the top. They're showing us that kind of characteristic W shape of the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus triggers the release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary by signaling with GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. The anterior pituitary in turn responds by secreting follicle stimulating hormone FSH and luteinizing hormone LH and remember FSH and LH are named for their roles in the female reproductive system not in the male but they're the same hormone so we'll talk about what they do. So these hormones travel in the bloodstream uh, where they get down to the testes and in the testes luteinizing hormone appears to stimulate the interstitial cells also called the Leydig cells um, which are just outside of the tubules the seminiferous tubules to go ahead and manufacture testosterone while FSH makes its way into the tubule and causes cystenocytes, uh, these guys, the, the Sertoli cells, to go ahead and manufacture a protein called um, androgen binding protein. And that traps and sequesters the testosterone that's being made by the interstitial cells and helps the uh, Sertoli cells garner that and use that uh, to promote spermatogenesis. And as we stimulate spermatogenesis, we produce spermatids. The spermatids are responsible for releasing uh, inhibin as the spermatocytes develop into spermatids, I should say. Inhibin is produced. And of course, we produce testosterone as a result of functioning Leydig cells. So testosterone and inhibin both have a negative feedback effect on the anterior pituitary. So testosterone is a steroid hormone, so like most of our steroid hormones, it is synthesized from a cholesterol base. In order for cells to respond to it, they have to have a receptor for testosterone or some of its derivatives, dihydrotestosterone, DHT, or estradiol, or estrostenedione is another one. Um, these are just different forms of metabolically active testosterone. And interestingly, if you take any of these as a supplement, estradiol or DHT, your body will simply convert it into testosterone as needed. So what does testosterone do? Well, first and foremost, that's the guy produced by the 
interstitial cells that causes the Sertoli cells to stimulate spermatogenesis. So never lose sight of that. That's its main role. It targets all accessory organs, and what that means is that um, it up it upregulates secretions from the seminal vesicles, the prostate, Cowper's gland, mucous glands, any of the glands that are involved in sexual activity. Testosterone also causes an increase in in uh, epinephrine usage uh, and uh, growth hormone usage, and so it has a generalized um, metabolic anabolic effect, causes hypertrophy of most of our connective tissues, especially muscle and bone. It also has a role to play in libido, and maybe that's on the next slide, but it um, stimulates sexual desires in, in, in the brain. Some of the secondary sexual characteristics that we develop are listed here. Males tend to develop excessive hair or more excess hair in the pubic axillary, facial, and uh, chest areas. The voice gets deeper, and that's pre predominantly because the cartilage, the thyroid, thyroid, yeah, the thyroid cartilage, tips anteriorly and causes the vocal cords to be longer. Skin becomes oily. The sebaceous glands and our sudoriferous glands become a lot more active in response to testosterone. Muscles and bones increase in size, and the metabolic rate goes up. Um, not listed here, but also the production of red blood cells uh, increases. Like I said, testosterone does have receptors in the brain, and it stimulates, uh, or it says here, masculin masculinizes the, hu the, uh, the brain. It's especially active in things like um, aggression and um, libido, sex drive. We know that the adrenal gland produces a small amount of what are called adrenal androgens, and um, when those make their way into the bloodstream, into the testes, it just gets converted into testosterone. But as it mentions here, that's a paltry amount in comparison to what the testes actually produce themselves. This graph just shows you the levels of testosterone pre-birth and after birth throughout your lifetime. And it just basically shows that after 50 years of age, the testosterone levels having held steady throughout adulthood start to taper off. Okay, let's get on to the female reproductive system. <coughs> the female gonads, or the analog to the testes, um, would be the ovaries. The ovaries are the female gonads. So this is where we're going to produce the female sex cell. And the female sex cells are called ova, or singular ovum. The ovaries, instead of producing testosterone, they produce a family of uh, hormones that are called estrogens. And here we have estradiol, estrone, estriol. These are all similar compounds that collectively get called estrogens and a related compound called progesterone. Estrogens and the progesterone are the two main types of female sex hormones, both produced in the ovaries. And we have the accompanying accessory ducts. All right, let's get on to a picture here. So now we have a sagittal section of the female reproductive tract. And grayed out in the background are some of the digestive and urinary structures. You've got the rectum back here, and you have the urinary bladder there in the anterior. What they're focusing on now are the reproductive structures. Uh, we have the external genitalia, which consists of the um, labia majora, the big flashy, the fleshy fold here. And then um, a more uh, a thinner mucus secreting uh, layer called the labia minora uh, deep to that. Uh, then we have um, two openings in this in this area called the pudendal cleft, and I have an anterior view that we'll look at later that explains that better. We have two openings. The more anterior of the two openings is the opening of the urethra that goes up to the urinary bladder, and posterior to that is the larger opening to the vaginal canal. So this um, ribbed tube here is the vagina, so named because vagina means eight. Uh, so it's eight inches long, although that varies. And just posterior to that, we have what's called the greater vestibular gland, a gland that secretes a lot of uh, lubricating mucus into the uh, vaginal opening and what's called the pudendal cleft. 
And if we go all the way to the anterior, we'll find the analogous uh, structure in the female to the glands penis in the male. This is called the clitoris, which is uh, actually an erectile tissue, much like the penis. And much like the penis in the male is involved in sexual arousal, the clitoris is involved in uh, sexual arousal in the female. So the vagina is the copulatory organ, and it's essentially a receiving area for the, the male copulatory organ, the penis. And if ejaculation occurs, ideally it would occur in, in the vagina if we're trying to um, fertilize an egg to produce a baby. So the semen would arrive in this area where due to the clotting factors and and um, prostaglandins that are present in the in the semen, we get rhythmic contractions of the of the vagina and we get a clotting of the of the semen and with the vagina doing this um, rhythmic contracting it really almost has a peristaltic type uh, function and it moves that uh, mass of semen up towards this structure which is the cervix the cervix is the inferior protrusion of the uterus into the vaginal opening so the cervix is really the, the tail end of the of the uterus. The uterus, also called the, the womb, um, the uterus is a big muscular organ uh, with a hollow lumen, and that is, of course, where the developing uh, embryo and fetus would, would reside. This is where we would grow a baby. And then during parturition or birth, the baby would have to travel down through the cervix, the opening of the vagina, pass through the vagina, and then out. That's the vagina is also called the birth canal for that reason. The sides of the cervix, or really the sides of the vagina that surround the cervix, are called the fornix. Uh, interesting, it's the same term that we find as a, a structure in the brain. But this would be the vaginal fornix, and there's just an anterior and posterior uh, fornix. They're, they're the, the folds of the vagina where they go around the cervix. The cervix has an opening, which is called the os, and there's an external and internal os. Hmm, what else? Uh, we'll talk about the structure of the uterus in a little bit. It has three layers to it. It has an outer peritoneal layer, uh, which is simply called the perimetrium. And then we have the myometrium, which is the muscle layer. And then we have an endometrium, which is the mucus secreting inner layer. And we'll certainly talk about that in a little bit more detail later. The uterus is suspended within the pelvic cavity by several ligaments. Uh, here we have one to the posterior called the uterosacral ligament. And that just goes off of the lateral surface of the uterus back to the sacrum. And up here we have what's called the round ligament. The round ligament comes off of the anterior um, rounded part of the uterus, which is called the fundus same term that we use in the stomach, this rounded part. You have a fundus, a body, and then the cervix. Coming off of that fundus, just a little lateral, is the round ligament. Now the round ligament is one that pregnant women know well because as this uterus grows with a baby in it, it tips and has a lot of weight on it and it pulls on this round ligament and um, can cause actually quite a bit of um, lower abdominal and, and, and uh, uh, rib pain as it pulls on that. Coming off the side of, of the uterus and what are called the uh, uterine horns, we have the fallopian tube or the uterine tube. And the uterine tube is a fairly short tube, several, several centimeters long, that winds up terminating this kind of leafy structure here called the fimbrae. And that surrounds this white pillowy structure called the ovary. So the ovary is actually in connection with the uterus. Not a direct tube, though. There's actually an opening here. It is possible to have things leave the ovary, miss the fimbria, and float around in the abdomen. We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. The ovary, and not pictured here, but the ovary is directly connected to the uterus by a ovarian ligament, and we'll see that from the anterior view. The fallopian tube is supported laterally by this thing called a suspensory ligament that also contains blood vessels. And then also not shown here is a big sheet of mesentery that includes all of this. And that big sheet of mesentery is called the broad ligament. And we'll see that in another view as well. Okay. Go back up and make sure I didn't skip anything. Looks pretty good. <laughs> 
I mentioned the ovarian ligaments and the suspensory ligaments. The broad ligament um, is actually a sheet of mesentery. Let's go ahead and go to the next picture. So now we're looking from the anterior. So reiterate a few things we know. Here's the vagina down there with the fornix on either side. This is the cervix projecting down into the vagina. There's the os, the opening. Called, it's labeled the external os there, and then the internal os here where it more leads into the lumen of the uterus. We're looking at the big thick uh, myometrial wall and there's the mucus secreting endometrium and out here the um, this is actually peritoneum and that gets called the perimetrium. If we come up here we can see the cut through showing where the uterine tube is, comes off of the uterine horn and that comes all the way out here to the fimbrae. The parts of the uterine tube are called the fimbrae, that's the leafy end, and that leads into the ampulla, which is the swollen kind of enlarged end of the uterine tube before the fimbrae. Um, and then we curve around here, and we get to the area that's called the isthmus, where it gets a little bit narrower as it connects to the uterus. So you've got an isthmus, an ampulla, and then finally the infundibulum here. That infundibulum gently kind of caresses around this, like I said, kind of fatty, fatty, pillowy structure here called the ovary. And the ovary is connected, and there we can see it, the ovarian ligament, right to the body of the uterus. There's no tube in here to connect like an egg or anything in there. Now, there's a blood supply and a nerve supply that travels through there, but but not uh, not a egg conducting tube. For that, we're going to need the uh, uterine tube. Here we can see the round ligament coming off, I and mean, that would go off to the anterior body wall. Not pictured would be the, uh, well, yeah, it is. Uh, no, I don't think you can see it here. The uterosacral ligament would be back behind. This is called a, a cardinal ligament. Uh, the cardinal ligaments actually stabilize the cervix and, and the vagina. Now, this sheet that we see is kind of a semi-transparent sheet. Well, that's actually mesentery. And the mesentery that comes off the side of the ovary and actually has the uterine tube and the ovary kind of embedded in it, almost like it's hanging out in a spider web, uh, that's called the broad ligament. The broad ligament where it runs near the ovary is called the mesovarium. You can see that term right there. And where it runs near the uterine tube is called the mesosalpinx. So the mesosalpinx is simply the broad ligament where it's close to the fallopian tube. Mesovarium is a broad ligament where it's close to the ovary, and mesometrium is where it's close to the uterus. I'm sure there are reasons why they have these different names, but you can just kind of call the whole thing the broad ligament, and that's good enough for me. I think that's everything on this slide I need to point out. So I mentioned that the blood supply comes to the ovaries via the uh, ovarian arteries which travel through this uh, ovarian ligament. Wouldn't worry too much about the tunic albuginium, I wouldn't worry about it at all. We are however going to talk a little bit about the cortex and the medulla of the uh, ovary. We'll get into that in a second. What we really need to focus on that goes on in the ovaries is this idea of the ovarian follicles. Okay. <coughs> what I strive to do is compare and contrast spermatogenesis in the males to oogenesis in the females. Point out where they're similar and where they're different. Of course, they're both going to generate gametes, so there ought to be some similarities. They're both going to involve the process of meiosis. Um, they're both going to be stimulated by FSH and LH. Both the ovaries and the testes are going to produce the sex hormones, right? Testosterone in the males, estrogen and progesterone in the females. So there's a lot of similarities there. But there are also some key differences, namely with timing and what type of cells we produce or, or kind of an asymmetry to the production of gametes in the female where there's a kind of a symmetry to it in males. All right, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. The egg here is called an oocyte or an ovum. And it's going to be surrounded by a selection of cells. Now, early on, it's called a follicle, or it's always called a follicle, actually. But the follicle cells is just one cell layer around this primitive egg. And then later on, we'll have those cells will divide and give us multiple layers. And then they're called granulosal cells. Let me show you what we're talking about here. Um, 
in in utero, when a female fetus is developing, they actually generate all the follicles that they'll ever have throughout their entire life. These follicles that are generated when you're still a fetus uh, before birth are called primordial follicles and they really consist of little more than an oogonia and remember an oogonia is a cell that's going to divide it's like a spermatogonia it's a diploid cell that's going to divide by meiosis and um, a surrounding layer of very small cells called follicle cells now what makes it a primordial follicle is that um, before birth these oogonia actually start to divide by meiosis, so they don't wait until puberty to be prompted like do um, spermatogonia by uh, an increase in testosterone. Now here in utero, we actually start down the meiotic division path. We, we enter into prophase one of meiosis, and there the eggs sit. The, the eggs sit in that state until puberty. Now you develop about four million or so primordial follicles in utero. By the time you're born, that number has dropped to about 400,000. And then interestingly, by the time you get to puberty, that number has dropped to about 40,000. And I just, the fours are the numbers I remember. The actual numbers may vary a little bit, but you go from millions to hundreds of thousands to tens of thousands. So by the time you hit puberty, females typically have at least 40,000 um, uh, primary oocytes, which would be the cells that had just started into meiosis, but they rest there, they don't continue on. Okay, let's take a look at some pictures. Here's a uh, cross section through an ovary, it's a histology section of an ovary, and we have some fat that surrounds it, and out here we have a cortex. Um, this is cortical tissue out here, and then where it breaks up a little bit with the connective tissue in the middle, that's medullary tissue. And all of these uh, little islands we see in here, light-colored granular material, uh, those are follicles in various stage, stages of either development or degeneration. And I'm not going to go through trying to explain what they all are right now because uh, we haven't really gotten to the right part in the talk for that. But I will point out here, out in the cortex, we have lots and lots of these little small guys here, and those are actually, um, well, no, those are primary follicles, never mind. Out here in this area, a little too small to really make out, but we have tons and tons of primordial follicles. You can just kind of see the little circles in here. That's where the primordial follicles are hanging out. Now, when we get to puberty, we'll start to develop a half a dozen or so of those every month, and they'll become primary follicles and then secondary follicles, and the secondary follicles will enlarge until they become things called uh, vesicular follicles, which is what we're seeing right here, uh, fluid-filled. And that's about the size they'll get to when ovulation occurs. Okay, so it's talking about the female duct system right here. And we've already mentioned the fact that the uterine tube or the fallopian tube is what conducts the egg from the ovary down to the uterus. Now, ideally, if we're trying to produce a baby here, there would have had to have been a copulatory event. Sperm would have had to have been delivered to the uh, uh, vagina. And then from there, you got about a day to two days where those sperm can remain viable in the female reproductive tract. And so the sperm swim uh, up through the cervix, in through the, the, uh, the uterus, and then into the um, uh, uterine tubes. And they swim all the way up the uterine tubes till they get to the ampulla, uh, that, that uh, swollen end. I should have mentioned that actually you go with the fimbrae, the ampulla, and then you go through something called the infundibulum, which is the bend, and then the bend leads to the isthmus, and I think I forgot to tell you about the infundibulum. So the sperm swim up just a little bit short of the ampulla. They go to that bend, which is called the infundibulum, and they'll keep swimming, of course, but that's where they should encounter the egg. They would like to encounter the egg somewhere around the ampulla or the infundibulum. Again, the infundibulum is the bend. And that is where we expect fertilization to take place. The reason it needs to happen up in the uterine tube is because that fertilized egg, which we call a zygote, now has to develop for seven days before it's capable of actually implanting into the uterus. So if it doesn't get fertilized until it's like, let's say maybe the egg is halfway down the, uh, or, or has already arrived in the uterus, there's a real good chance that by the time those seven days have passed that that fertilized egg will actually pass out of the uterus and be lost completely um, or 
even worse, uh, well, I guess not even worse, it lost completely, there's no implantation, um, but more devastating for the female is if it implants in the vagina, uh, which is not somewhere that a developing embryo can survive. All right, lots of terms we've talked about already. Within the uterine tubes, um, we actually do have some ciliated cells in there, and the uterine tubes are muscular, so they can create a peristaltic wave that helps propel the egg down towards the uterus. And it also gives a signal to the sperm to know which way to swim. The, the, the sperm have to swim upstream. There are non-ciliated cells in there as well that also provide some nourishment to both the oocytes and the sperm. So let's take a look at this here. Um, so now we kind of are going to imagine that this antral follicle here, this vesicular follicle, has just ovulated. Now it comes an egg, and it's swept into the fimbrae, which are kind of beating with cilia to create a current that goes down the uterine tube. So let's say the egg comes out here and it floats around. It's swept into the fimbrae via the, that current, goes through the uh, the infundibulum and the ampulla. And now it goes around the curve here, and the curve is called the, did I do that backwards? I did it backwards, I'm sorry. The, hmm. Okay. So the fimbria of the flowery ends here. We sweep in the egg, it goes through the infundibulum and then the ampulla and comes around the bend towards the isthmus, and right around here in the ampulla area, between the infundibulum and the ampulla, that's where we expect to have fertilization occur. And then that developing zygote now will develop for six or seven days as it comes down here. And once we get to day seven, we can implant in the endometrium, and that's ideally where we'd have an implantation, somewhere up near the fundus, uh, hopefully not covering the uh, cervix. So it comes down too low, and covers the cervix, then we can have a, um, uh, a placenta previa occur, where the developing placenta will actually occlude the opening of the of the uh, cervix, and that'll prevent a uh, baby from passing through there, and that would mandate that we have a cesarean delivery. Okay, what else we got? Anything new? I think we're good. All right. No, oh, let's back here for a second. Back up here for a second. So that egg is ovulated out the surface of the uh, the ovary, and it actually just kind of explodes out in a in a, a fluid pressure driven explosion, a little bit like popping a pimple. I know it's kind of gross, but that's sort of analogous to what happens. So the egg pops out here, and then it has to be swept by these fimbrae and the cilia uh, into the infundibulum and and the uterine tube. Sometimes it misses. Or sometimes it gets here and it falls back out and it floats around out in the peritoneal cavity. And literally, this is the peritoneal cavity. Um, and that egg could go anywhere. It could land here on the outside of the um, uh, uterus on the perimetrium. It could land over here in the broad ligament. In fact, that's the most likely place it would land. Or it really could land anywhere in mesentery in the, in the abdomen. Well, just an egg cell is going to just break down after a day or two. It's going gonna, it's gonna to degenerate. But... If sperm make their make their way down here, the sperm can actually fertilize this egg, and then the egg can implant on the outside of the tube, on the outside of the perimetrium of the uterus, on the broad ligament, and that fertilized egg can now develop, and we call that an ectopic pregnancy when that occurs. And as we'll note when we t get to the developmental chapter, we'll see that um, uh, the uh, the developing zygote is an all-inclusive package. It brings everything it needs to develop into a baby. So we don't actually need the uterus to support the development of a baby. We need the uterus to be able to properly support the development of a baby and certainly to have parturition or birth um, through, the, through the vaginal canal without implanting in the uterus. That's going to be impossible. But we could actually develop a baby out in the peritoneal cavity. And that's called an ectopic pregnancy. So while that's extremely high risk, depending on where the implantation occurs, you may actually be able to bring that to term. There are some places where it will be impossible. 
if the egg develops or if the zygote develops in the tube. If implantation happens not in the uterus but up here in the uterine tube, that's called a tubal pregnancy, and that's not going to be compatible with life. Um, that's not going to allow the baby to thrive, and it's also going to harm mom and may even may, may even wind up killing the uh, mother. So that is almost always terminated when that occurs, if it's diagnosed. But you can have an ectopic pregnancy where it implants, say, the best place for an ectopic pregnancy would be implantation on the outside of the uterus, um, because usually that has enough room to develop. And the, the baby will develop its own system of membranes and enclose it. It's high risk because you don't have the separation of the myometrium to keep it away from the mesentery and the internal organs, and so it could become entangled in that. And, and cause damage to the vasculature of, of mom. I guess there are times where once this develops, they can actually go in surgically and open up the uterus and move uh, the entire developing uh, amniotic sac into the uterus and see if that works. But the um, placenta would have to remain attached uh, where it grew, which would be on the external surface. Okay, that's ectopic pregnancy. Pelvic inflammatory disease is simply what happens when an untreated, um, usually urinary tract infection, spreads to the peritoneal cavity. Um, that can lead to the development of scar tissue. And if you develop scar tissue anywhere along these uterine tubes, that that's going to very possibly lead to um, uh, sterility. If we go back and take a look at this picture from the sagittal section, you'll note something about the position of the uterus way back here. Okay. The fundus of the uterus is tipped anteriorly. That's called an anterovert um, uh, uterus. And that's a little more than half of the women. Uh, this is kind of considered the normal position. But from my understanding is it's almost a 50-50. You get a lot of women that have an anterovert uterus. You get several women that have retrovert uh, uterus. And you get ones that are neutral, that stick straight up. Um, and the conventional thinking is that the anterior vert is the is the best position for the baby to develop. Um, having a retrovert or or a straight up uterus is correlated with a little bit of trouble in, in um, difficulty in births. All right, let's see here. let you read over the uh, cervical cancer statistics. I'm never going to ask anything about that. Should be worth noting, though, that it's a very common cancer in females. It's routinely screened for um, between the ages of 30 and 50. And um, the type of screening that's done is this uh, Pepinicolau uh, is the name is somebody's name. It, that's where the name pap smear comes from where they look for abnormal cells to see if maybe there's some morphological changes in the cells of the cervix. And if there are, then that can be an indication of a pre-malignant state. Mentions here, nearly half a, um, half a billion women worldwide each year are diagnosed with cervical cancer, and um, nearly half of them die. So it's a significant uh, disease. Uh, we talked about some of the ligaments already. You can find those in lab. Nothing else to add there. The significance of these two sacs that it talks about here, the vesicouterine pouch and the rectouterine pouch, is really just that they're, my understanding is anyway, they're landmarks that can be found on um, a sonogram. So when you're trying to visualize the, um, the uterus and the position of the baby, you can use these pouches, which are fluid-filled pouches. Let me go back to show you where they are. So in, in an anterovert uh, uterus, you have a rectouterine pouch, which is between the, the kind of the isthmus, the, the thinning part of the uterus, and the rectum. So that's called the rectouterine pouch. That's the posterior one. And then between the urinary bladder and the uterus and the peritoneum, you have the vesicouterine pouch. And like I said, I guess on a uh, sonogram, you can see those, and that can be used to visualize the position of the uterus. Okay, pouches there. 
Okay, let's talk about what's going on in the uterus itself here. The wall of the uterus. Uh, what's the best picture for that? Okay, here we go. So we know there's three layers. I mentioned them before. We've got the perimetrium on the outside, and that's really derived from the um, uh, visceral peritoneum. You have the much, much thicker myometrium, which is the smooth muscle wall of the uterus. And then you have the endometrium. And the endometrium, as we'll talk about in a minute, actually has two different layers to it. It has a basalis layer and a functionalis layer. The basalis layer is the source of the blood supply to the entire endometrium and um, also contains the bases of the mucus secreting glands called uterine glands. The functionalis layer is very interesting. During the first half of the monthly uterine cycle in, a, um, in an adult female, the functionalis layer grows. It's called the proliferative phase. It grows thicker, it secretes mucus, it has, it's highly vascularized, and it becomes capable of supporting the implantation of an egg. If it doesn't receive, or the implantation of an uh, early embryo, if it doesn't receive that embryo and the corresponding signaling of progesterone that comes from the ovary, then it breaks down and it's shed. And, and that, that, that shedding of the endometrial lining of the functionalis layer of the endometrial lining is what menses is. So these are two layers of the endometrium I was talking about, the stratum functionalis. This is the layer that becomes highly vascularized and um, mucoid and supports the implantation of a uh, early embryo. And the basalis layer, this one remains and contains the base of the blood vessels and the, the glands to regenerate a new functionalis layer every month. And it says here, it mentions here that the functionalis layer is prompted to grow by estrogen and is maintained by progesterone. The basalis layer is, is not affected by the ovarian hormones. So here's a uh, uh, histology slide. We do have slides like this. I don't always get them out in lab, so we'll see how we're doing on time. And if we have time, we'll get it out. Down here, we have the myometrium. That's the muscle layer. And then we have the base of the glands down here in blood vessels. So this is the uh, basalis layer of the endometrium. And then as we progress up here, the tissue becomes a little looser. And uh, that's your lamina propria connective tissue, that loose tissue. And then we have the ends of the uterine glands coming up here. And also in here, it's a little hard to make out though, we have um, arteries and we have spiral arteries that come up and that may be one there. So this layer is what's shed during menses and then this layer is maintained. And then during the proliferative phase of the uterine cycle, we just um, grow a new functionalis layer. Here's a cartoon showing what's going on there. So you have the uterine arteries, and the branches of the uterine artery are called arcuate arteries, and I don't really care that you know any of that. It's pretty amazing how well vascularized a uterus is. If you ever see a, a, a picture of an angiogram from uh, from a uterus, it's just it's a big mass. It looks like a um, looks like a bird's nest almost of blood vessels. It's incredibly well vascularized. So we go through the myometrium, and then these um, what they call uh, radiating or uh, what do they call them here radial arteries radial arteries uh, and and veins they come up here into the um, endometrium and at their base they have kind of a stable structure and then as they go up here they become much more brittle and labile uh, these appear as a result of constriction of the spiral arteries down below will actually degenerate during menses so the blood the blood supply will be the blood supply will be choked off here in what they call their uh, spiral arteries or coiled arteries and then the functionalis layer will be shed because of that. Over here we have a uterine gland so these are the ones that are secreting mucus out onto the surface and that's mostly what we saw in this previous diagram. These are the uterine glands here. Okay, the 10 centimeters in length. I think, guys, that's where I'm going to stop for right now. I will pick up a little bit later, and we'll talk about some of the external structures, and then we'll get into what's going on with the hormones. But for right now, I think we'll take a break.